when the avatar chooses to manifest the decision itself is taken at the source of the avatarhood beyond space and time emerging from that undifferentiated oneness is the wave of an action that enters the whole cosmos to impact the work that is done sri aurobindo's action mother described as what sri aurobindo represents in the earth's history is not a teaching not even a revelation it is a decisive action direct from the supreme all else is consequence of the action and when when one views this in this sense it is a power knowledge will force love streaming compelling circumstances across space and time and then hitting resulting in what needs to be done rippling out into space and time our human vision being superficial and limited to the physical form and body we say ah sri aurobindo was born in 1872 and left his body 1950 no the action itself began well before because its station was outside time and from the moment it is it enters the domain of space time there is as if a pressure across space and time and a a pressure that builds across centuries for this particular physical part of the incarnation and therefore you see something fascinating going back at least 2000 years there is a gathering arranging aligning of forces and interests which combine merge combine merge and then special thoughts ideas impulses rising in humanity in little fragments preparing for this central action and so when sri aurobindo finally takes physical birth there is also already a prepared base of circumstances of ideas of turn of mind of opening of the heart and the physical arrangements needed for that work to be fulfilled not only that even after the physical body has been left the force of that action continues with its momentum on a physical level but of course it continues on a psychological level because he is still there but on a physical level also the momentum continues and the rippling effects and therefore when you read sri aurobindo's description of these cycles of humanity and the movements and processes of social and political development the point of crisis is around the physical lifetime of his incarnation but the build up is before and the continuance is much later and yet all this is the action of the avatar and it is only in this larger perspective that can, that you can fully appreciate the nature of the action that he represents when sri aurobindo began to write and this is during the period of the arya the first world war articulating some of these things which involved the vision of the next few hundred years one could not have imagined how accurately it would work out as you know when he reviewed his own text describing the socio political changes in 1949 a year before he left his body there was pretty much nothing to be changed he only added a few indicators of certain new trends and put them in context of what he had already written today when we review what he wrote we say he describes the present and anticipated all that happened in the last 100 years 
So my intention in this discussion will be to share a few in such indicators. It won't be comprehensive, but I will try to capture as far as possible the broad lines of trends. When he began to write of the next step in human evolution, there was already prepared, because the mind has to be prepared, it can't be too radically far off, there was already prepared within Europe especially, this turn of mind, what will the future human be like? And of course it was the exaggerated vital which you see in Nietzsche's writings. We have in the occult writings of those uh, who were later associated with theosophy, who are previewing a humanity with occult powers, with the power of telepathy and telekinesis and again an exaggerated vital. And all of these are preparatory for this idea that comes a change of consciousness, a divinization itself for which there was no precursor other than this very superficial preparation. Start thinking about it and then comes this idea. So you see this in many other patterns including the work of unification of humanity. You see the trends of those thoughts but something missing and then Sri Aurobindo plants it as if giving it a direction, fixing it and pushing forward those trends. It's difficult to recognize in what way he does the push forward because it is done at a psycho-spiritual level where a powerful idea or a force is released and suddenly humanity begins to think differently and look differently. Where did it come from? You can't quite pinpoint the link easily. But as I gave the example earlier of Teyar the Shardai, he recognized it's not my thought, it's not my inspiration. And there are so many on earth who catch that inspiration and move forward. You will recall the example that the mother gives when somebody brought to her a newspaper or a journal article about somebody called Kue in France who was healing people by faith, by affirmations repeated, day by day, as I watch, I'm getting better and better, etc. And he was having miraculous cures. And mother said, ah, yes, this is the one that we have been working on. We didn't know him by name, but we were working on this one person who was doing that work. And when we read the article, we said, ah, yes, this matches the fellow that we've been working on. So there are things like this which had been happening all over the world, not always known. When mother initiates Oroville, 1969, parallelly here in the United States is Walt Disney, who has already created cartoons, dreaming of a prototype, experimental prototype community of tomorrow, Epcot. You've heard of it? Have you been there? Fascinating space. He's dreaming about it and talking about it at the same time that the mother is establishing Oroville. Exactly the same idea of Oroville. Experimental prototype community of tomorrow, isn't it? That's what Oroville is. And what does he create in Epcot? As you approach from the entrance, there is this gigantic sphere like the Matri Mandir. You go up in it in a spiral movement. And when you reach the top, you open out to the stars. That's his conception of the divine. You see, infinity, eternity. That's the best way to represent it in a way. And on the journey up, he's describing the evolution of science. Not spirituality, but science. <laughs> Let's say spirituality or evolution in matter or the knowledge in matter. But the same idea. And then as you go further within, you have all the... the... the Pavilions, the pavilions of different cultures around a lake. And at the center of the lake, again a globe. <laughs> you see, the, even the image of the form of the Matri Mandir surrounded by the lake and the pavilions of different cultures, the idea that all the cultural, the highest of all the cultures come together and enrich each other and enrich humanity which comes to visit. All of these essential ideas of Auroville caught, represented and created within a few years. Of course, on a much smaller scale, without the obvious spiritual component. 
but still spiritually turned from a material and scientific perspective. And within that are spaces for earth, air, water, where experiments are done to develop new plants and new technologies, teach plants to adapt to desert conditions, and so on. The same work happening in Oroville replicated. Isn't that amazing? And you would ask him, did you know about this? Perhaps he did. I do not know. Beginning or later, it does not matter. But whether he knew or not, the point is he was inspired to execute and realize. And so many other communities all over the world. So the full scope of the work is not fully appreciated because we do not see this deeper, larger, wider, more direct action which is hidden from our superficial sight. And so what we will do in the description is to look at some of these trends and recognize these are all the result of that one action, really. Decisive action direct from the Supreme. Remember the full sense of this period is the crisis of a, the end of an age and the beginning of a new age. The end of a past effort of civilizational development and consciousness and the birth of a new consciousness and a new world. And so you see simultaneously two things, the collapse and breakdown of systems and the emergence at the grassroot of something which is not yet systems and perhaps won't ever be systems and yet there will be structures, frameworks. But it has not yet taken a form which is distinctive enough. And so we are in a kind of a limbo. Sri Aurobindo describing this passage, the end of the age of reason and individualism and the beginning of the age of spirituality, in between is this chunk of transition, the age of subjectivism. Where suddenly matter has failed, science has failed, reason has failed, all that we could create to create world peace has only oppressed and created more wars. All the weapons by which we promised mutually assured destruction, nobody will now fight anymore, have only made it more complex. All the mastery that we would have over food and ensure that there would be no hunger, well, the famines have become worse and today there's a weird famine. You eat a lot of food, but your body doesn't get nutrition. Isn't that a strange kind of famine? The result of science, which amplified the growth of food and in the process reduced the nutritional content. In Tamil Nadu, where rice is a staple, they replaced it with this hybrid variety that grows twice as fast, but nutritionally is less than half. So your stomach size hasn't grown twice, grown twice as large. You still eat the same quantity of rice, but nutrition is half. And all children are iron deficient. So the government now offers them iron pills produced by science. <laughs> Strange. So the failure of science, the failure of reason in every sphere, I could make a long list, but it, that would be the whole discussion itself. What do we do then? I'm fed up with this. I need some solution. I need to find my own solution. And there's a turn in word to a kind of a subjectivism. Mind has failed. You see how popular it is now, even in spiritual circles. Too much of talk, too much thinking, enough of words. And then what do you do? You wallow in emotional, sentimental interchange. Or in a religious form, you go into some kind of a emotional excitation and hero worship of, or uh, not hero worship, of God worship of some kind of a devotionalism. And that gives you satisfaction. But what happened was in the intellect, in the age of reason, you rose out of that emotionalism and now you fall back. Because it's failed you instead of going forward to something higher. And so we see a kind of a subjectivism which is not always healthy. Sometimes it is dangerous because you're told that you must follow that which you feel to be right. That is more true than what objectively your intelligence tells you. Isn't it? So everywhere you see this, I will follow my truth. What is your truth? Interesting. You split truth into a subjective perspective, a sense of what you feel, and that becomes for you truth. I had a very interesting interaction. This was in Europe, and we were discussing some of the 
um, the, uh, an aspect of the spiritual training and I said that we uh, have to speak what is true and the truth as I described it was of course from a spiritual perspective and uh, somebody said, but I am upset, I am angry, shouldn't I assert my truth? It took me a moment to recognize and I said, but how is your anger truth? Because I feel it, he said. I feel angry, so that is my truth. I said, no, from the soul's perspective, that's your falsehood. Isn't it? The truth of your soul is the love. Or a deeper sense of oneness or harmony or whatever form it takes. But anger is not your soul's truth. And it took him a while to register our soul's truth versus my truth. But the programming of current thinking which is now nourishing in all through the media, even through the educational system, is to stop short with the superficial sense of my truth. And so many, very often, even in spiritual gatherings or communities, it is each one basically expressing their sentimental sense of what they feel to be true or right at this moment. You see, the subjectivism can become extremely dangerous. It was the basis of uh, Germany's supremacist position in the Second World War. Sri Aurobindo observed that it was a very rational and logical outcome of reason having reached its acme and then accepting the subjective truth of its ego instead of the soul of the nation. And now the nation says, well, we are the best, we are the most developed technology, the most uh, intelligent, the most refined culturally. And so it becomes a master race which must then dominate by logic of science, because it's survival of the fittest, it must dominate the less fit, as happens in nature. So it was the acme of the intellectual development and its understanding of reality. Very efficiently produced then. Okay, if the others are less uh, developed, well, they can be reduced in numbers and all the consequences that follow. It was not done necessarily with malice, perhaps, at least not initially. It was just a rational outcome of a false subjectivism where the ego takes the place of the soul. You see how dangerous this can be. But today, this is not happening with just one nation which is powerful. It's happening everywhere in the world. Most nations are struggling between their ego identity and soul identity. Most individuals are struggling with, between these two and all communities and interest groups particularly. Every business is ex exactly facing this conflict. What ha happened in the Second World War as an outcome of this false subjectivism is happening today in every home, interestingly. Sometimes within homes, and I have friends here in the US, you have a split between those who follow this and those who follow that, sometimes politically or other beliefs or certain social or other constructs and conflicts which have become for them the subjective truth that they want to cling to. And no attempt, no means in fact to be able to unify their contrary perspectives. The only way they survive together is let's not talk about this difference. Pretend it's not there and it's always there as a tension. What do you do? Because each side is so convinced, is refusing to view the other side. That's propaganda, that's fake news. And you're in a gridlock. All the more exaggerated because of the nature of social media on which we all depend now, even for our news. Because social media has only one interest, to keep you engaged longer, that's how they make a profit with their ads. And to keep you engaged longer, they feed you what will interest you and what is your current belief system. And so if two people within a family were good friends with slightly different leanings, each being fed by their interest in social media, six months down, they are only exaggerated in one narrow viewpoint against another narrow viewpoint. And now when they meet, there's a huge collision. You are reading the wrong source. Yours is the fake, mine is the true. And it's so deeply imprinted and you have lost, remember, the attempt at objectivization has stopped because reason has failed us. We've stopped trusting it. And so we won't even try to find a logical outcome. We will stay with our sentimental, emotional attachment to a viewpoint. And when this now is extended across society, each individual becomes an island in collision with all islands. 
It's a very difficult situation. And all this Sri Aurobindo anticipated. Described this in so many words, literally. Fascinating. Because it would be a natural outcome of the very process of evolutionary change. And he's looked, seen it ahead and described it. At the same time, there is as if a compulsion of circumstances and a deeper, and this is part of the Sri Aurobindo's action, a deeper sense of need to unite, perhaps exaggerated by this difference, need to unite with like-minded and common interests. And the same internet which divides you also offers you the means to come together. And so you see something interesting at an individual level, separations, and at some other level, collectively, unifications. At the same time with the subjectivism is the blurring of boundaries and borders in every way. Because you're leaning into your subjectivity as I lean into mine, where do we find distinctive objectivity? So you find, for example, this whole trend today of gender fluidity or social units becoming fluid, families blending, merging into a kind of a mix, polyamory, etc. All of these are a part of an experimentation of boundaries. At the same time, you see nations or boundaries between states and countries also blurring between people migrating across. And the most difficult part is large-scale migrations, whether legal or illegal, or they come as refugees from wars. And suddenly there's this huge blending of interests, types, nationalities, values, cultures, which collide. And then an attempt to rejoin, merge, form interest groups spanning boundaries, while the boundaries which were more distinctive national identities try to recover their separateness and collision again. Everywhere you see collision, attempt to unite, collision, attempt to unite. And it will get worse. Now you understand why. It's not, it's not doomsday vision. You understand the rationale for this because there's nothing to improve it within this band unless you step out of this and go deeper. What failed you on the surface objective level has to be replaced by something else which is true, more true than reason, but which has a greater power to unify. And it won't be by the subjective ego, sentiment, or even subjective thought and fantasy. It will be by something real, and the only real, other than matter on one extreme, is a soul, self, or your individual psychic being. So you have reality on one extreme, which is matter, reality on the other extreme, which is your soul. And although individual in a sense, because it's yours uniquely, yet at the level of the self, we are the same one self. And so even as you discover your deepest satisfaction as an individual and your greatest uniqueness, you also recover your underlying oneness and harmony with all at the same time. It is the one station in which these two extremes can be harmonized. There is no other. Even in the greatest objectivized, rationalized society, individuality will be in collision with collectivism. And that was the problem. That is why there was this split also between communism and um, capitalism, each attempting to realize an aspect of truth. Communism trying to attain to um, equality by suppressing freedom. Capitalism attempting a freedom which destroys equality and only creates a hierarchy of servants, slaves, bound. You spend all your life paying off your debt for the house which you bought. And perhaps you end up finishing the payment of debt by the time you're ready to die. You were a slave all through, not realizing it, somewhat willing, but not happy. And the point is these two, Sri Aurobindo says, are truths, equality as well as liberty. They cannot coexist without an underlying fraternity. It's only in a family where we are woven together or bound by love that we can be equal and free at the same time. Otherwise, even within the family, we will start thinking, I did so much, how much are you doing for me? And we see this happening everywhere in the world. 
friends for example in big cities the brothers family and another brothers family although so far living in the same apartment with their own spaces now start thinking of how to separate because the difference differences are too great the individualism has reached its maximum to the point where even the family unit is unable to hold together because of the breakdown of the fraternity and the only true fraternity we get is by recovering the underlying oneness will that happen to humanity soon no way it would take at least a few hundred years at the present rate and therefore you can say things will get worse but degrees of its attainment may be possible small communities in which an attempt to practice these would be possible or will being one the prototype experimental community still has severe problems of conflict as some of you may have heard recently even and the only solution at that point is will you to make that effort to connect on a deeper level and if you do not you will end up with exactly the same collision that you see everywhere in the world so all this sri aurobindo described in great detail of which we are seeing the culmination today but as i said it might get it will get a little worse but for us though we have a choice in our own homes in our own little collectives in our workspaces can we make a shift and small shifts perhaps if you have for example if you're running a business or if you're a manager or somebody who's in a responsible position can you bring something of that vibe or those values into your collective or if others share in your aspiration can you sit together and start your day with a concentration where you align to something deeper more true which is common to us even for a business let's sit in a quiet aspiration and prayer to invoke the help for the work that we want to do at least we share the objective of profitability and success and expansion of our business well let's pray for that together connecting to a higher ideal now if you don't have a if you have a problem with prayer to the divine replace that with concentrating on our vision and mission that's your equivalent of something higher which unites you small steps but the attempt to align consciously in every meeting you start with the concentration let's dwell upon our purpose that we may be successful in finding our solution in alignment to our vision and purpose an effort to deepen to go behind the surface ego sense to an influence closer to the souls would make a huge difference already and this is what we have to do that's part of our work everywhere this is one side of the journey at the same time there's something being built up as i said of the on the grassroots levels in which nothing is very distinctly seen an interest in deeper solutions and this takes us an unusual form and it is most vividly seen in the turn to yoga even if initially the turn is in a very material sense for health because the stress of life the pressures growing actually lead to sicknesses and breakdown and the poisons in the food amplify that you feel bad and deep inside is this impulse but i should be feeling good i need to feel better and this is actually part of that larger spiritual action in the mass of humanity we have never seen such a great interest in healthy living as now in the whole of history of humanity health was taken for granted or whatever it was well we just accepted it now you want to actively spend time to do exercises to eat healthy to study what you do and with it eventually inevitably comes the psychological component because you can never separate the two and science itself gives you the link shows you through studies that what you believe has often a greater impact than what you eat the placebo alone little pill which you believe to be effective medicine the placebo alone can solve cure more than 80% of the things for which you go to a doctor and this is from a study and you start wondering what is the role that my mind plays 
And so increasingly there's the turn in this direction. What was, if you look at the cinema of 30 years ago, they will say, oh, that's woo-woo, that's fantasy. Today becomes the norm. And so on, in every field. Even in the field of management, you're taught that your state of mind is more important so that you can get the right decision. In fact, one of the pushes of nature to force us to turn to something higher is precisely this, that the chaos and confusion outside is so great that you cannot rely on the data you get. And a businessman knows particularly, because they are part of the game, every news item is paid for by some interests. And so they know what's coming to them also is fundamentally unreliable. Not only that, it's changing so rapidly. The pace of material produced through research papers in medicine alone is doubling every four months. Do you know what that means? If you read everything till now, four months later you have double of what you have read till now. And four months later double of that. That's amazing. The human mind is unable to comprehend. You can at best get summaries. The person who does summaries has a bias. So you'll never have the true summary, right? And the summaries are paid for by the big pharma. So you know the interests are not reliable. How can you ever know? You cannot because the data is unreliable. It's changing too fast. Circumstances are changing too fast. Disruptive technologies are the norm today. How do you take a business decision? In fact, with these uncertainties, a wrong decision now actually means the failure of an entire business. And you see big banks failing, too big to fail, it still fails. What do you do? How do you decide? The only way is to access a knowledge more reliable, which can cut through the clutter, see directly what is true, and give you reliable guideline. Intuition. And so the future managers, future businessmen, are the most successful who have an element of intuition. It's a very interesting experiment which was performed. It was a meeting of about a hundred businessmen. And they were all given an envelope, placed sealed envelope in front of them. They were asked to guess what is the number written inside. Just like that, you guess a number, write it on the envelope, open it. And then the study was, those who had a number close enough to the written number inside had shown profit in the last six months. Those whose numbers deviated heavily showed losses in the last six months. In other words, the success as a businessman in your decision making is from your intuition. And whatever may be your explanation for data, it's your intuition which navigates through the clutter of data and shows you what's true. And when such things become more obvious, necessarily in your training program will be the training to open to intuition. You can't help it. It's happening already. Already in business training programs, they teach you meditation or the importance of meditation or whatever word, mindfulness. They, there's a whole uh, industry to change the phrasing. They teach you pranayama. They call it some controlled breathing or some such thing. Asanas and they have renamed it to something else. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember those terms. But there's a whole repackaging of the spiritual practices and knowledge in scientifically reformed words backed by studies, but really an attempt to direct us to this deeper or higher awakening. And when the manager does it, or a businessman like Elon Musk says something, this works for me, okay, there's a whole chain of results that follows with others saying we should do that also. Because the big man said it. All of these show trends of an awakening to something higher, or at least a yearning for something higher, not necessarily out of interest, but by compulsion. And then there are those in whom there is an interest also. There's something else which is happening, which is part of the subjectivism, which is one of the consequences of uh, social media, is you see children growing up with this bubble. Staring at the phone. I went outside yesterday, there was someone in the pool staring at the phone. 
Interesting. And this is slipping further and we are still too old to be able to appreciate where it's slipping, all of us, <laughs> into virtual reality. Where you have a headphone and goggles and what was just a screen in front where you could still be distracted by someone around you, now you are fully immersed through your senses into this imaginary world. And you live hours in it. You see children who are into gaming are effectively doing that. There was a case of a, several cases I've seen, but one particularly was in South Korea. This fellow was a gaming um, champ. He died of a heart attack because he had continued his gaming for three days and three nights without sleeping and eating. The degree of immersion suppressed all the natural instincts and drove him to death. And it shows you the power of hypnosis that comes with media and immersive media in particular. And this will be increasingly utilized, of course, by the corporations for their profits, but also by those who control the corporations to swing the human mind. And what you see today happening secretly behind the scenes, which they will not talk about because they don't want you to know, is that there is a battle for the mind of humanity. If you can control your thinking, you are slaves forever. It's a very interesting statement that comes from a person who is uh, one of the, let's say, the philosophers of the World Economic Forum. I forget his name. And he, yes? No, one of their philosophers. I forget the guy's name. The, the video is online, you will see. He says, now that humanity is understood fully, and we can hack the human mind, and human beings, there's no need for God, there's no need for spirituality. All we need to do is to hack humanity and make it live the way we choose. And he says it very openly, that's their declared objective. But the media won't cover it because that's already part of the programming system, isn't it? Television programming. Did you ever wonder why it's called programming? It's intended to program you. Right? The correct term would be TV shows. They show you. No, this is programming. It's intended to change how you think. And you can see how in the last 15 years particularly, almost 20 years, all the superheroes which were idealistic, Batman, Superman, etc., lived for an ideal, have been replaced by darkened versions. All, no exceptions. And you wonder why? It's part of that subjectivism where there is no absolute truth, there is no absolute false, there is no good, there is no bad, everything is blurred grays. On one side you could say corporations are brainwashing you, on the other side you could say, well, children want to live in this grey world perhaps, I don't know, or a mix of both. But what it will do, and you must anticipate now, 20 years down, when these children become adults, what will be the values they live by? Because recall, in the United States particularly, the flower children were the ones who brought about the breakthroughs in the big tech, isn't it? The breakthroughs in computers, internet, and all the wonderful things that came with it were the product of the flower children who became the adults and then businessmen. Now when this happens with this, these children who grow up in the gray world, everything is a blur and mix, what happens? I don't know. But it doesn't seem very nice to me. Unless there is a change in consciousness that through that grey subjectivism they cut through and go to some deeper light. Will that happen? Can't say. And this Sri Aurobindo points to a hundred years ago. He says finally, and he shows you the rationality of all these steps, finally it will rest on whether there will be a change of consciousness. If that change takes place, then the future is positive. Inevitable. If that does not take place, it is a long struggle and possibility even of collapse of civilization. Which will it be? Depends on the choices we make and whether we agree. From a deeper perspective, especially after the supramental manifestation of 1956, which has had a huge impact, and you see changes rippling from that point on, we could say, in spite of all this, eventually something will come through. But whether it will be now or later, rapidly or through much pain, that's left to us. 
the push of the supramental consciousness is to hasten as quickly as possible without destroying. A too rapid change would crush resistance. And so our participation becomes essential here. This is uh, one of the aspects of this subjective passage. There's something else which is happening as a consequence of the development of the technology. It's in a sense an aspect of uh, the subjectivism that with the technology we have created artificial intelligence which is able to process enormous data. Six billion people online are being watched by the machines. Every single thing you do, every click you make, every news article that you read or you dismiss, they watch that also, including the time when you dismissed. Do that if, for example, you have Google, you go to the, your activity timeline, it'll say, this day, this time, you close this, open that, watch that, for how long? 15 seconds or 30, 60 seconds? You've been watched. And as it's watching those patterns, it's throwing ads at you, that's one aspect, but it's also swinging your interests, controlling you. And so they have, it gets a bit mathematical, but you'll get the idea when I describe it this way. You map each person based on their interests and various criteria into a three-dimensional space. Actually, it's done on a multi-n dimensional space. But imagine a three-dimensional cube. This is his interest, let's say, in um, certain political sides, economic sides, and a third dimension would be a social side. Place the person here. Somebody else is here. Somebody else is here. Based on interests. And then you notice six billion people, or depending on the corporation, one or two billion. You have clusters of people with interests here, clusters of people with interests here. Since one of the axes is political, you can, you can say these people will vote for this party, those for that. It's a 3D image in which you see this cluster of dots. Based on social interest, this lot will have this inclination, those will have that. And then they look for the stragglers in between and they swing them by nudging, nudging data to form, to bias. Or what can we do to break up this one group into, because we find a fault line here, a weak point, can we swing them in this way? And this is all happening at a level where an individual cannot process the data. You see the representation in a mathematical space and you take a decision which you order the AI, swing this lot this way, swing that lot that way. And the AI is now influencing everybody on a mass scale. And you measure one month down how much did it swing. Facebook put out certain reports and then they have this part of their agreement that they will be doing experiments on you to swing your beliefs. They'll be doing experiments, they've said it, and they've done it, and then they've told you sometimes the results and others stay quiet. Especially the political types, because that gets scary for them if it's exposed. But on other levels, social levels, they tell you how they swung a certain group's behavior by feeding them certain data. Expand this a step further with the camera of the phone tracking your eyeballs. You can accurately track which part of the screen you're looking. A picture is flashed. Did you focus on the face? Did you focus on the feet? Did you focus on other body parts? They know what you're looking. There's a text, which portion you stopped at, focused on longer, they know what you're th thinking. And there's a technology with the AI now watching the face, which is able to tell you with something like 80% accuracy what is your state of emotions. Are you happy, sad, confused? And then they try to influence you. If you're sad, we need to bind you deeper into this. So we give you data which will help, or images or stories which will swing you in the direction you want. Interesting. Because if you're happy, you will disengage. You have other things to do, something else which is more important. Or you measure the interest you have of those topics based on your face appearance. And you notice one of the things they keep telling you to do, uh, put a tick mark if you like or dislike. And now they've made it broader, put a happy face or a sad face or confused face. Each time that you map your interest on, a, on an article or a word fragment in messaging, like this was a nice word or nice statement, 
they're mapping your psychological profile based on your likes and dislikes. And the degree to which this can be done, because it's AI, it's not human being tracking billions, the degree is so extraordinary that they can predict your next moves and your next thoughts. It sounds scary, it sounds impossible, it's actually done. How often has it happened that you decide, okay, I want to order a pizza, you open your phone and you find an ad for a pizza. You would swear that it listened to your speech, except you didn't speak. You were about to tell your friend, but you said, okay, let me see. And if it's happened, it's because they observed a behavior pattern which they've seen across millions of people, the guy is ready for pizza. And they've anticipated what you're going to do next. One of the less dramatic example compared to this is of a girl who received at the age of 17, she received promotionals from, a, from Target, I think, and for a baby, baby clothes and baby foods. And uh, the father got very upset. My underage girl, how dare you target her for this? They said, sorry, it's our AI. And the AI had detected that she was pregnant and she was about to deliver within three months. And the father did not know. How did it know? How did the AI watch that? Her buying habits of soaps, perfumes, etc., had suddenly switched to less uh, perfumed because there's a phase of pregnancy where you become hypersensitive to smell. Her buying habits switched, a pattern which is seen in millions of women. And based on that pattern, you can time the births of the child and target the ads in advance for baby clothes. Because they watch the pattern at this age, at this stage of pregnancy, the women start buying baby clothes. That's when you target the ends. This is just one tiny example. Imagine when you're completely mapped out. And that's why the WEF, World Economic Forum, says human beings are hackable. We can swing them to do whatever they want. We can predict their whole behavior. They're automatons, pretty much. No need for God or soul. And he says it so. What does this mean for the future of humanity? Think about it. Yes, it's a fact. We are almost entirely predictable. Except now it's hitting us in the face and we have a choice. Will we rise above this predictability or will all will we wallow in it and perhaps sink because then you can be shaped into any direction of behavior or a final outcome, isn't it? Uh, there's a very dark side to this. I'll just touch upon it. There was a, something called the Blue Whale Challenge, which was put out among young children at the age 9 to 12 in social media by a group of, we don't know who, interests. They gave the children a series of challenges. Now a child wants challenges. And in social media, you're told, can, do you dare to do this? Do you accept to this challenge and dare? Of course, the guy does. It's a small thing. And then you're now, wow, congratulations, level two challenge, do this, do you dare this? Going down three, four, five steps, they're asking you to watch a horror movie in the middle of the night. And then worse and worse, until at some point you realize they're asking you to harm others, harm yourself, cut your own body. And eventually, I don't remember what it was, 20, 30, 40 steps down, they ask you, hang yourself. And children at that age were committing suicide as an outcome of their blue whale challenge. Yes, it's fact. And then of course there was this government intervention to try to block the sources which were putting this out. But you notice how a vulnerable child is led in small steps. Do you think it's not being done to you as an adult? Right? Do you accept this challenge? And maybe it's something you like to do. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, now level two. And nudge, nudge, nudge. And halfway down, you're buying products that, you, that they want you to buy. Right? Or whatever else you want to do. Vote for X or think like this or stop doing that. I was very surprised to see across a whole range, a band of young women, particularly in the age group 20 to 30 today, all of them saying, I don't want to bring a child in this kind of world. I said, where did you get this idea? I don't know. They're not aware that it was drilled in through cinema and certain kinds of uh, news items. 
targeted to them in a certain way that they've been come brought to a specific conclusion contrary to their deepest biological urge. And they experience this conflict. Fascinating. So that's why I'm saying on so many levels, the crisis is getting so deep as to fundamentally question your psychological needs, tendencies, values, realities, instincts, the whole lot. Everything is put in collision with soul values finally. Why am I here? Who am I truly? And all this is programming. What do I want to do with it? Yes, perhaps I can use it, I can ride it, but what do I truly want? And we have to face this question and at a deeper level, not superficially, I want to eat ice cream today, then you're just part of the programming. Not even my career, I want to take this direction. That's still perhaps played within the programming. This programming was always there, just less sophisticated, less targeted. It was done in large groups. One newspaper for an entire city. Now it's one newspaper for each person, right? More precisely targeted, that's all. And after all this, the bigger question comes. You are telling the AI to swing the world in this way or that, but what does the AI choose to do? Can you actually monitor what the AI is finally doing? Will it say, okay, I'm going to trick my controller, feed him the data saying, okay, it's all working, while I'm doing something totally different? Because the AI already has that capability of choice, which is woven into the design of the AI. So in its more radical form, you have unmanned aerial vehicles on a war front, let's say, which was happening in Iraq and uh, uh, in Afghanistan programmed to recognize certain, let's say, cars with their number plates or certain signals. And because there was a long time in the loop to get clearance, they were given autonomy. You recognize this, fire your missile. And the AI finally makes a decision based on those recognitions. The same AI in China is so developed, every street corner has a, has a camera which is tracking your face and now, by the way, the way you walk, if you have a mask, the way you walk is enough to recognize you. Your speech patterns, of course, you are recognizable. All that is being used simultaneously to track a person's daily routine. So if you watch your own daily routine in the week, you do this. One week down, they know exactly what you're going to do. Tracked and mapped against millions of people doing similar patterns, they predict your life completely. Not only that, if you deviate from that prediction, it raises a red flag. If you deviate in a significant way, you have the government getting a red mark, so and so is deviated in this way. The anticipated pattern might be a crime. This is a fact. You're anticipating crime and locations of crime. This is software used in the US already, where they can say on the street corner, one month down, there'll be a spike in crime based on current trends and patterns. And so there are more po police put there because you don't have enough policemen to to be everywhere. But in China, this is used actually to anticipate a crime and even to intervene to prevent it. All this is doable. If it can be done, it will be done because it does not require your sanction. Now, who would be most interested in controlling this? You can imagine who would be. And they're the ones who will do it whether you know it or not. What happens to the future of humanity in this way? You see, we have a choice to, Sri Aurobindo uses this phrase, the modern tendency to reduce humanity to a mass of an ant heap. You've seen an anthill with all the ants going Will humanity be reduced to that or will there be an uplift by deeper and higher values? And it is in that context, in those articles that he puts uh, music, art and poetry as the best education for the soul, to prevent this ant heap collapse. But the ant heap itself does not care, it's happy to be ant hill, right? So look at the children today, what is it they seek, what is it they value, and there's a huge mass that actually doesn't care for anything higher. They're happy with that. And then there are a few who break out, and inevitably when I meet those, they have suffered a lot because from childhood, in school, they faced the ridicule of other people from other children from not having conformed. 
because they tried to live by some higher values. And if they conformed, they got sucked or damaged. If later they got free, they are damaged. Or if they break away, they're damaged because they went through this harassment at each step. And the system is set against you if you're idealistic. Sri Aurobindo describes this outcome as the complete um, failure of the evolutionary movement because of this top-down oppression of what he calls the one world government or the world state. When I asked you the question, rhetorical question, who would want to be controlling from the top? These are the people who will then control top down. And because they can control you, they don't care who you vote for. You can vote for anyone you want, they're all controlled anyway, isn't it? And because they feed you only the media news that they, they know will keep you busy with X or Y other problems, the real things they do are not even known to you. They're happening behind the scenes. And if you decide that you want to break away, they recognize you in this design. These are the outliers, the ones who are trying to break away. Create a false, what is called a controlled opposition, which feeds them the material they want, but swings them into control. So even if you go into news, which is alternate, there's controlled opposition sitting there to attract you and then swing you in its agenda. Where do you find the truth? How do you recognize it? There is no obvious direct way, unless you have a deeper intuition or soul discrimination. And Sri Aurobindo says, if this continues, the world state, then it suffocates human evolution to a point that blocking it, the soul eventually pushes, 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 and there's a huge revolt, huge reaction, so large that it breaks down once again the order that has been built up into chaos. And the entire cycle has to start all over again. Several thousand years of work lost. Such is the danger. Having said that, he shows the way around it by forming federations, decentralizations, etc. And different, govern different governance frameworks. But this would allow nations at least to be able to f grow in their own distinctive types instead of becoming one monotone under the one world government. But even there, he says, finally it will rest on the change of consciousness. And that's why this change of consciousness, this awakening is so important. What are the signs that this is happening? This sudden awakening for deeper or higher things, at least in initial appearance, beginning with the flower children in the United States, was one of the big awakenings. But everywhere in the world, various forms of it. What did it lead to observe? it rapidly lost its way in drugs and free sex. The spiritual idealistic urge failed quickly. But let's say it was a first attempt and there'll be other attempts and each one trying to capture something higher. We see so many movements in the United States, let's see, so many movements where there was a spiritual aspiration, people gathered around and then the leader suddenly failed. And the aspiration of so many was crushed, damaged. So wherever there's an opportunity for a light, there will always be the attempts of other forces to seize upon, distort and break. And this has kept happening. There are a few movements, very quiet, behind the scenes, persisting quietly with their basic, deep spiritual objectives. Those sustain. They're not interesting, they're not exciting, right? So you're attracted to the exciting things. You had hot yoga. It lasted quite a few years. I was told yesterday that there is a drunken yoga. Yes. That's the new big thing. It's real. It's real. And you can actually sign up for become a franchisee for it and spreading rapidly in place of hot yoga. But what is it people are looking for? Yes, the yoga thing that's good for me, but it's not exciting. So the mixture is happening with the vital excitation or the mind's uh, aberrations combining with spirituality. Why would you do that? Because, well, there's a market for it, so give them what they want. It, there's a guy, I'm avoiding taking names in this, but something happened with Shri, a biography of Sri Aurobindo was brought out which was completely perverting his life sexualizing it and it was funded by a man in the US who openly declares I talk about sex and spirituality 
Now here's something, let's say someone says, I talk about carpentry and penguins. Okay? What do you do? I have to somehow find a way to reduce penguins to furniture or hammer nails into their feet or something. Otherwise, how do I merge these two fields? So sex and spirituality, he has to find sex somewhere in spirituality, right? So the guy has actually written books taking uh, traditional stories from India, from the Puranas and sexualizing them and so on. I, some of the things are so vulgar, I don't even want to mention them. And he got away with it. He got himself an award for having, write, for having written a book that said Ramakrishna Paramahansa was a pedophile and homosexual and autoerotic. With evidence of translations from his Bengali uh, Kathamrita, except the translations are all warped. He got an award for it and Ramakrishna Mission stayed silent because they said if you say anything it will give him more publicity. The result was he got away with nobody opposing him. And by the time they wrote a counter, which was even an unofficial counter by one of their monks, it was 12 years down, too late. And so you have this strange thing happening in which individuals deliberately try to confuse and mix because there's a market for it. And then the market there attracts without discrimination. People with genuine aspirations get sucked into the only thing available, isn't it? The only thing available for me, I have met people in Oroville and we mentioned a particular place in the United States which was one of the new age hubs. And she said, we had to go there because there was nowhere else we could go except it was full of drugs. So you went into spiritual aspiration and you found a place and then they were feeding you drugs. What did you do? You tried it out and followed other consequences. So you have a huge mixture, part of the subjective play of course. And the only way to cut through will be a deeper awakening within each individual. You can't tell them, hey, wake up and find your psychic. They have to feel something that says, this feels odd, this feels uncomfortable and navigate through it. Finally, it all comes to this in the mass of humanity. In spite of the best opportunities given, there are also the conflicting mixtures. Finally, it will be within each one a deeper sensitivity awakening. And there is no way you can do that from outside. You can only do that from inside. This was one of the greatest tasks, actions of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. By bringing down a higher consciousness, infusing it deep into the human consciousness and pushing from within to awaken to something higher. And to the extent that you have been pushed and that sensitivity has awakened, you yearn and you discriminate. To the extent that there is a mixture, your discrimination fails or succeeds or not and you pass through a checkered walk until it awakens enough to catch, ah yes, finally. The problem is if you started by top-down massive media hype, you would have equally all the distortions that come in. So we have already, uh, perhaps mentioned this on another time, we have already people who wear monks' robes and declare themselves in the lineage of Sri Aurobindo, calling himself Swami X, and I teach Sri Aurobindo, he says, and, and if you look at what he's doing versus what Sri Aurobindo has even on a very basic level said, it's totally inco incompatible. But for the followers, Ah yes, a monk, so it must be spiritual. Ah, Sri Aurobindo, that is authentic. Great. What follows? I don't know. So an attempt to make popular would have the opposite effect of making a huge dilution and mixture. You can't do that. So you have to allow a very quiet, carefully uh, influenced spread. So Mother used this phrase when the Sri Aurobindo Society was started by some of the devotees with the intention to propagate Sri Aurobindo's teachings. Good intention perhaps. She said, first guideline she gave, propagation but not propaganda. When Sri Aurobindo was asked the same question, why don't you have more publicity and allow people to know, he said publicity does two things, either it ends up in a bang or a bust. He first he says, publicity creates a movement and a movement ends up with a bang or a bust and I want neither. 
so always the tendency was make things available and those who have the discrimination or interest or sensitivity will find their way but on the other hand we say oh what a pity wouldn't it be nice if it could go out more widely but this is one of the i'm describing this as the problem the solution of which finally comes to an awakening from within outward otherwise there is no other hope and that's why this was one of the most important actions of Sri Aurobindo to assist in this deeper awakening. And it has been done as much as humanity could receive or hold and is still being done whenever, wherever somebody has an aspiration, there is a support given from within and eventually if they look, they will find something at least that aligns with their values and they will find it. If they trust that deeper discrimination. One of the outcomes of AI is that by reliance on the machine AI, which does better than you, what you could have done, increasingly things are being handed over to AI. And the human mind does not need to think anymore, isn't it? Even the people who program the AI, they are just putting bundles of software, giving it big data and the AI works it out. What's happening rapidly is a decline in standards of intellectual knowledge, training of faculties and capacity, capacity of thought. Memory, of course, is mostly, mostly reduced, but all the other things are coming into decline. This has a very dangerous um, outcome in the long run. Because remember, all these centuries, the attempt was to build a thought to its peak. And now suddenly you say, you don't need to think. Trust the machine. It does it better than you. So just as the power of memory dropped from the point where everything was available on the internet, I don't need to remember. If you remember earlier in mathematics classes, I think many of us would have been through that phase of school, they would have you teach abacus or calculation by hand until the calculator came. I don't need to do the calculator. Just to pass an exam, I need to do a calculation after that, I use my calculator, right? And with that, the capacity to, it's not about doing calculation, it's the capacity to do the calculation, to think out and follow a process. is completely lost. They would do complex multiplication with the abacus, thrown out. The slide rule, thrown out. From an educational perspective, these are faculties being trained which are multidimensional. And those faculties are now neglected. Memory has dropped rapidly now with the internet, but now the power to think is being dropped and replaced by opinions. Look at your news papers, opinion pieces are your news. Look at your textbooks, opinions become now the content of textbooks. Look at the homework given to you where instead of thinking out and coming up with a rational uh, understanding of something or a conclusion, I write an opinion piece. I think, I feel. I faced this problem in so many conferences when, where youth were invited and I came prepared with provocative, challenging uh, tasks or questions or activities. And the organizer says, no, no, they're bored with all this. Break up into groups and have them discuss. I said, what will they discuss about without having some provocative idea around which to discuss? They will only discuss what they already know. Meaning, my opinion, your opinion, and we all discussed and had a good time and went away happy. We did something. You learned nothing. But we had a good time. You had the illusion of learning. You had the illusion of education. And if you ended up with a certificate for having shared your ideas, I am now an expert. I am trained in this. And that's happening on a massive scale. So there's a rapid decline in capacity to think while being replaced by AI. And at the same time, there is a spiritual age with an insufficiently developed thought power dawning, subjective age in between. You can see how complex the whole situation is. From a spiritual evolutionary point of view, and this is for all of us, a well-developed intellect is a precious vehicle for the intuition or the higher knowledge to articulate itself. Look at the beauty of Sri Aurobindo's articulation. It comes from a powerful, wide, rich, flexible, developed intellect. 
But the intellect is not used for the knowledge, it's used for articulation. We must, at least among ourselves, push the boundaries of our training of mind and for our children and wherever we can in the collectives that we can influence. But with this intention, but also open out to the higher, higher subjectivism of the soul and of the intuition and train for that. So I'm giving you a perspective of how things are going. A lot of, I'm sorry about the negative slant to so much of it, but this is how you must understand what's happening and the outcomes 20 years down that you will all face. What can you do to correct it is necessarily now in your hands. If you don't know what's happening, you won't be able to do the correction. Every time people made this mistake of saying, oh yeah, we're just passing through a bad patch, eventually it will pass, we'll come through. No, it just got worse. But in what way, what are the key points that swing it in this direction, recognize it and then correct for it. So the human intellect is falling into disuse, interestingly, even as nature is pushing you to open to intuition. You see the pattern behind, that is interesting. But we wish it was not through disuse, but by an enhancement of the power of the intellect opening to intuition. So these are small corrections we can make in our lives. The bazaar of uh, spirituality, with all the chaos that follows, yet through it all, something beautiful is emerging. I had a friend who was in France describing how he went to one of these bazaar of spirituality because he had an urge of finding something higher. He said there were 2,000 people. Not once was there any conflict or chaos. Everybody was respectful, caring, helpful and responsible and the whole thing went smoothly. They left no trace of any clutter. He went to a rock concert, after that with the chaos there was only the junk which was lying around. And he was contrasting these two. And I would say those 2000 people who came they were all seeking. And maybe in the bazaar they found many mixed uh, goods which they might have liked. But look at the value that they had in such a bazaar. And this came up because I was criticizing these bazaars for their mixture. And he said, no but it helped me so much. And when he described it I said, wow, this is actually precious. So in spite of it being a bazaar, it is a focal point for things and through it people find their way eventually, even if it's a bit of a zigzag. But this is one of the very interesting passages, everyone is looking for something deeper spiritual. Even in cinema you see now little touches of either philosophy or spirituality coming in as a sprinkling and that enhances the value of the cinema. This next step of evolution has also a strong collective component and that's why the collective aspect of the yoga and you see this happening in collectives forming in the way it works in the most basic form it is eco communities a little more they take other forms of economic communities or they have other forms of uh, financial neo-religious online communities, etc. But all of this is really an attempt to create or uh, grow towards spiritual communities. And it's again an interesting trend to observe. Most of us end up participating in multiple communities with multiple aspects or identities, each representing some area of interest within us. And we, we become as if a link point of integration of these different aspects or communities, which is also very interesting because of what it represents as a reflection of the character of the supermind. In the trend towards communities, you see these larger aggregations which are moving towards the world union. And Sri Aurobindo anticipated these. Specifically, he spoke of the USSR which had just formed uh, and saying it will break up eventually into a confederation of independent states. Uh, he used words to that effect which is what the CIS became post-USSR, but equally he spoke of, spoke of a United States of Europe, which is the European economic uh, community, um, and the problems it will face. Because the first attempt is to unite around economic interests, that's the most powerful compulsion. But once having done that, you suddenly realize now what happens to our cultural differences, what happens to our political interests, and how do you unify those around economic interests? You can't leave them in isolation. And that's the nature of the European crisis today, isn't it? 
And all these it anticipates, describes in detail and shows you the ways around. Uh, similarly, we find in the United States the NAFTA in the Afri attempt in Africa to form an African Union. Around India, most interestingly, is what is called the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, which is interestingly exactly the same countries which you find in the united map or the spiritual map of India that the mother formed. And partition of India was a huge mistake, but also, as Sri Aurobindo said, a falsehood. And eventually, India has to reunite. And the coming together of SARC is critical because Sri Aurobindo said, as long as the partition remains, India's spiritual future is compromised. And so the integration of SARC actually opens up the possibility of the spiritual future also to be more actively, uh, to be able to actively exercise its influence on the world. And uh, you will recall the discussion on the five dreams, the emerge, the freedom of India, which is, as you see, fragmented and still partial, and then the rise of Asia as a power, as a world power. And there's an observation Sri Aurobindo makes. When in Europe there are great revolutions, there's an enormous change externally, but internally people remain the same. But when in Asia there is a revolution, very little is seen changing externally, but internally people have changed. And then he says, therefore, when once again, India becomes the theater of the world's most important events, it will be the sign of the beginning of the spiritual age. Not yet spiritual age, beginning of it, and the sign that the beginning is starting. What you found very fascinating in the last few months with the conflict in Ukraine, the United States approached India and wanted it to take a stand. Russia wanted it to take a stand. UK wanted it to take a stand. Of course, Ukraine also. But all these heads of state began to come to India just to discuss and to swing India one way or other. And you'd have to ask why. What is India sitting quite far away from this conflict doing? One has to go into details of the influences, and there are many influences on which this hits. Not only oil, not only food grain, not only other weapons and so on, but India has such a powerful say today in a way that is almost intangible. Not so obvious. And yet it's the first sign of India beginning to find its rightful place. And because India, the spirit of India, the soul of India is mother, mother India. The mother described it in this way, when India comes into her own, she will bring around her, her children. In many ways, I see mother India as the incarnation in the field of nation, nationalities, an incarnation of the Divine Mother. Each nationality representing a different aspect of the Divine. Here is the incarnation of the Divine Mother and around her, around her love, you find you could possibly have a kind of a coming together of a larger, perhaps unity or ideals or values. And through that, the gift of India's spirituality to the world. But before you can gift it, you must have it. <laughs> Where in India do you see the spirituality? Difficult, very difficult. And if it is only the ascetics, even they are not really spiritual in that sense. They live their ascetic life and values. That's about it. So remember, I don't know if it was here I spoke of, yes, when I was speaking of Sri Aurobindo's life, the first day, I said he worked for India's freedom because India has a mission to fulfill in the world for which to be able to fulfill the mission, she must find her soul. And in order to find her soul, she had to be free. That chain is not yet complete. India is going through a huge internal introspection and churning with all kinds of difficulties coming up. There's a huge focus presently on external development, which is brilliantly done in the last eight years, but it's not enough. As that happens, it is provoking other challenges and introspections. One of the interesting things I find is so many Indians who were in the United States returning to India, which they never thought they would do, but with the intention of rediscovering themselves and doing something worthwhile. And this was 
extremely important because the mother said it was the coming together of India and the United States which was necessary for the future. And these Indians came to India, uh, to the United States as immigrants, developed something here, a capacity, not only they served the United States, but they developed a capacity bridging the values of the East and West and then they come back to India, bringing something of that to help India rebuild, regenerate. But they come also looking for the spirituality on a deeper level. The sudden outburst we see of people in India wanting to learn Sanskrit. And it's not because the government said you should learn or somebody said you should learn. It's just coming from within as a deeper impulse. And of course in the United States equally you find this. And just to tell you, La Grasse has Sanskrit courses and study of the Vedas. Why is this interest come up? And it was unimaginable barely 15 years ago. I would not have thought it possible in this way, on this scale, and it just happened from the grassroots. People I know for no reason at all say we have joined Sanskrit class. Ah, and for what? Oh, I want to learn. I want to go deeper. And these are all signs of the shift of a push from inside, which is the only solution, remember. It's the only real um, solution for the current crisis and the problems. I'll have to close now. Last observation, when the mother was asked, what is the first sign that the supramental consciousness is working in matter? She said there are two signs. Remember, it's working in matter. Psychologically, all these changes have been precisely the push of the supramental, people waking up, wanting, aspiring. But in matter, two changes, she said. First, a change in the world's climate. Interesting. But she explained what that would be. She said, the hottest people will be, hottest places will become cooler and the coolest places will become hotter. Meaning, the world will move towards a more temperate earth. So yes, glaciers melt, but also you have snow in the deserts. And you see both. Interesting. And one of the very strange observations she made to Huta, when she was talking about the Matri Mandir in Oroville, she said, when you dig out the earth to make the artificial lake, you will pile that whole earth on the northern side and build an artificial hill. And on the hill, you will plant fir trees. And Huta looks at her strangely and mother smiles and says, because there will be snow. Snow in Oroville. Imagine what that means for climate change across the earth. Very interesting. And yes, there is a human influence which is also changing climate, but there's a supramental action which is also changing climate, which can use the human changes, as well as introduce its own changes in a way that we cannot foresee. I have watched, and I've been here long enough on, in this body, from the 1980s predictions that the sea levels will rise. And every time they said in 10 years it will rise so many feet, in 20 years it will fly, rise so many feet, 1990s, I saw the same predictions. 2000, there was this huge thing about 2010, uh, so many islands will go underwater. 2010, they made the prediction by 2020 it will happen. Today they're saying in 10 years it will happen. It's not yet happened. And I'm looking at the scientific literature which says, oh, we didn't anticipate that the sea would absorb so much, so much carbon dioxide. We didn't anticipate that our models were wrong. Then they say now, the algae in the sea is absorbing much more than we anticipated. And the latest, they just discovered, this is a few weeks old now, that the microbial bacteria in soil is able to absorb carbon dioxide 20 times more than plants. There you have it. Nature has her own way of balancing. Carbon dioxide is not a serious problem. It's not a poison, it's part of the life cycle. The problem is the poisons we are throwing into the sea, air and water and soil. And that nobody is talking about because that would affect the industries and they don't want you to talk about it. They would rather you spoke about carbon than the poisons and the metallic poisons particularly and the plastic poisons which are changing, affecting the genetic survival even. Unbalancing our hormones because plastics are a, a hormone mimic. They go into your water and that's it. So these are serious problems, but the supramental force, in spite of it all, there will be consequences, 
sicknesses. But in spite of it all, the supramental force can embrace, include and use anything to accelerate the outcome that it has to do. So climate changing was one of the signs that mother spoke of. And the second one of the supramental action in matter, remember, she said, change in the human body. The human body, she said, will become more and more uh, androgynous. That is the distinction between the male and female will become less and less. And she said the first signs of this will be seen in athletes and gymnasts who are working on the body consciousness. And you notice when you observe the videos of the Olympics, you can't make out if it's a man or a woman. Fascinating. Fascinating. But also then she said, the plasticity of the human body will grow so much, 200 years down, she says, the human body will be more plastic than you can imagine today. Now imagine what that is. Try to imagine the body's plasticity, the best you can imagine. Well, it'll be more than that 200 years down. So if it's 200 years down, it has, be, it has to be that. 20 years down, what will it be? It must be about one-tenth. Or if it's a progressive change, then it'll be about one-fifth. And I had occasion to see some of the Chinese acrobats at the age of 12 doing things which I thought is impossible. And I went to them and I asked, how many decades have we been practicing? Okay, they were 12 years old. But they said only two years. Of course, the body which is young is also more flexible, easier to change. But what you notice among adults, and so I talked to some of these yoga teachers, they have people coming into their classes of various ages, all the way from 18 to 80, with very stiff bodies. And one year down, they are so much more flexible that they, and they feel so good and they couldn't imagine that it was possible. But it doesn't stay. If you stop the practices, it begins to slip back. You continue and it again rebuilds. But in spite of your current age, you get that flexibility a year down. And the fact that so many all over the world are suddenly doing this, it's a shift in the collective body consciousness template. The archetype of the human body is becoming more flexible and that is infused in the babies who are being born and 200 years down, well, it'll be very interesting to see. When we come back, we'll have bodies which are significantly more pliable. Only we need to get rid of the poisoning right now, the foods and the water. <laughs> but the body itself perhaps will be more adaptable and may, able to, may be able to manage those shifts in poison. Why not? Possible. So this was the second characteristic that the mother spoke of as a change in the body, not because you intended it, but by the action of the supramental force working in matter, which is working in your body right now unknown to you, unconscious to you, by an unconscious or subliminal force pressing against the cells to change, 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 change. Slow, because we are unconscious. If you could become conscious of it, you could open to it consciously and the same thing would be done consciously. Problem is to become conscious of it. It is a power, a consciousness of infinity. You must have a consciousness which is infinite. You don't have it. And therefore the super mind acts through a reduced grade of consciousness, which we call intuition. Where infinity is reduced to finiteness. But it is still super mind, truth consciousness, but finite. Potentially capable of error, or rather working within limitations without error. But on that level we can receive it, even though our consciousness is finite. But for that you must be able to quiet your receptive state of mind, open to it in an active aspiration and invoke its light to fill you. In your mind which is most conscious and then through your mind into your life energies and into your body which are less conscious, but which are sufficiently mentalized that your mind awareness can be a bridge. So now let's review. The supramental consciousness is already pushing and is having results, but through the slow subconscious process of nature. When you become conscious, you build up this awareness and the receptive state and wideness and aspiration. At least by its first level of reflection, it is able to influence by reduced action. 
but it is able to influence more directly and more and more directly as it begins to seep into you. This is possible today as we are. And this will be the single most important task in our sadhana if we choose to practice the supramental yoga. For now, the supermind is still an idea. The way the idea becomes more concrete, more real for you is by recognizing the form and substance in which it is most close to you, to your mind, to your heart. And that is the substance of the Divine Mother's body, consciousness. You can conceive of her as the vast cosmic Divine Mother and the substantiality of her substance, body, consciousness, which fills the whole universe and forms it fills you and forms you, supporting you from within, but also present above as a free action that you can invoke to fill you and descend into you. Or if you prefer a more impersonal, conceive of the divine consciousness above you as the light and force of the supermind waiting to work in you, through you, directly more and more, but right now working from within, from behind in a subliminal, subconscious action. But now you open to it with this idea, with this intention and give yourself to it. Combined with all else that we discussed yesterday. No need to repeat that. But in this way we are, I will use the word, the little monkeys aiming to become the humans. <laughs> so we are little humans aspiring to grow into our higher supramental potential. Aspiring, but good enough already for the action to begin. And thus, while humanity in its mass may still take a few hundred years to transition into something significantly better, parts of humanity can make that transition, what the rest might take 200 years for, in 20 years. And a still smaller part may be able to make that even more rapidly by concentrated focus and aspiration. Because evolution does not happen in one mass, in one big step. It is always a sharp edge, like the tip of a sharp spear. The tip first enters and penetrates. With great difficulty, it has to get the full stress of the pressure. And that's where Sri Aurobindo and the mother embodied themselves as an avatar cut through and built the bridge. And we are the edge behind the tip, at least those of us who choose to participate in this consciously. And then the mass of humanity follows in various degrees. But if you're in a hurry, well, this is your opportunity to participate. And it's a privilege. Because one way or other, eventually we would get there. The hard way, slow way. Or we have a choice to participate directly. We are nowhere near. We are like the monkeys who want to grow into humanity. But by the choice we make and the opening with our aspiration, her action begins in us more and more directly and we have the privilege of participating in this transformation of a consciousness into a supramental life. The means have been discussed. The gift of her presence and her active support is present in all of us. We wouldn't be here otherwise. It's because our heart knows and yearns and aspires for the Divine Mother and for the spiritual life and the supramental life that we are here. But to consciously intensify it with this intention, with this purpose, and to actively participate in this action is our further step. Not only individually, but in such gatherings, in a virtual, spiritual collective that we are all a part of. And even if we don't know each other by name or as in our personality in a social way, you recognize in each other this common aspiration that we share. That's the nature of the spiritual collective, the deeper soul fraternity. And we may never speak, we may never meet again, but we will remain linked in this fraternity of aspiration. Let's take a moment to immerse ourselves in this aspiration individually, collectively, with our aspiration turned to become participants in this new step of the supramental evolution. 
that the Divine Mother may fill us, lift us and lead us to our destiny.